This Parsha podcast is sponsored by Barry Dubin in loving memory and Le'ilu Nishmas of Andy Stern, Gershon Yakrov Ben Moshe, commemorating his first yard site. May his soul be elevated in heaven. Parsha's Kisavo has 122 verses and six mitzvos, and we're really nearing the end of the book of Deuteronomy and consequently the Torah. There's only four parshas left after this one and only three more mitzvos. And this week we mark another transition in the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to finish with the mitzvos that have been the subject of the three most recent parshios. We're going to learn a little bit about the instructions of what the Jewish people need to do once they cross over the Jordan, once they enter the land, once they are no longer under the tutelage of Moses, it's been transferred to Joshua, what they need to do on the day that they arrive. And we're going to begin the final party message of Moshe as he's about to pass. And that's going to be the subject of essentially the rest of the Torah. And it begins with the mitzvah of Bikurim, which is the mitzvah to designate the first fruits of your orchard to bring them to Jerusalem and give them to the Kohen. It will be when you enter the land that Hashem your God gives you as an inheritance, you possess it, you dwell in it, you should take the first of every fruit of the ground that you bring in from your land that Hashem your God gives you, and you should put it in a basket and bring it to Jerusalem, bring it to the place that God chooses to make his name rest there. So this is the mitzvah, uh, similar to the mitzvahs of tithing and truma, that you take the first fruit. Now Rashi tells us this is only from the seven fruits that Israel is praised with. Rashi also tells us that there's a whole elaborate ceremony when you walk on the field and you see the new fruits or the new produce budding out of the ground or off the tree. You take a special string and you wrap it around the fruit to know that this one is the first fruit. You put it in a basket and there's a whole joyous ceremony of bringing the fruits up to Jerusalem, and there's a very elaborate process that we'll see actually in the ensuing verses, and you give it to the Kohen. Rashi tells us that this is to teach us that even if the Kohen is only the Kohen in your days, this Kohen pales in comparison to Aaron. It's just a regular random Joe Kohen. Still, you have to give the mitzvah of Bikurim, the first fruits, to that particular Kohen. And you tell him that I declare today to Hashem your God that I have come to the land that Hashem swore to our forefathers to give us. You make that initial declaration, you give him the basket, and then you go on to the lengthy declaration and pronouncement and proclamation that you say once you have given over the Bikum, given over the first fruits to the Kohen, you make this pronouncement in the temple grounds, in the place where God chooses. Then you should call out and say before Hashem your God. And you begin with essentially the earliest history of the Jewish people. An Aramean tried to destroy my forefather. You begin with the very genesis of the Jewish people when it was just Jacob and his small nascent family and he was subject to the trickery of Laban, his forefathers. He wanted to destroy our forefathers, yet God saved him. And he descended to Egypt and lived there in few in number. They became a great nation. So you're kind of detailing the whole history of the Jewish people. The Egyptians mistreated us. They afflicted us. They made us work really hard. We cried out to God. God heard our affliction. He heard our travail. He saw our oppression. He took us out of Egypt. You go essentially through the whole history of the Jewish people. We went out of Egypt with an outstretched arm, with great awesomeness, with all kinds of miracles. And he brought us to Israel, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now present time, I brought the first fruit of the ground, and I'm giving it to Hashem, our God. There's this whole really long and really unique declaration where the person who has some new fruits in the land of Israel, after the land's been settled, you have some new fruits, you bring it to the temple, you give it to the Kohen, and you start essentially from the beginning of the history of the Jewish people, and you delineate all the tremendous good things that the Almighty has done for us to bring us to this point to the temple, to giving the first fruits. And Rashi tells us that the essence of this mitzvah is to declare that you're appreciative. You acknowledge all the good that God does for you, you have gratitude, and you demonstrate that in this mitzvah. Of course, there's some other components of, of the process. The basket is waved, etc. But that is essentially this mitzvah, the first mitzvah of our parsha, the mitzvah of Bikurim, of first fruits. 
Now, the commentaries point out that there are many oddities, many unusual characteristics to this mitzvah. For example, the Midrash at the beginning of the Torah, at the very first word of the Torah, Bereshis, the Midrash tells us that there are several things throughout the Torah that are called Reshis, which means the first of. And here, in verse 2 of our parsha, Vilakhta me Reshis, you should take from the first fruit, that is already being invoked in the first word of the Torah, Bereshis. And the Midrash tells us over there that the reason why God created the world was for all the things that throughout the Torah are called racious, all those things, those are the purpose of God's plan, of God's creation. The reason why God did be racious, the reason why God created the world was for all these things that are called racious. And amongst that list is this mitzvah. So for example, it says, Jewish people, they're called racious, and God created the world for the Jewish people. Torah, it's called racious, God created the world for Torah. The mitzvah of Bikurim, the mitzvah of bringing the first fruit to Jerusalem, that's called racious, and the world was created for that. Which is an astonishing statement that this mitzvah that comes all the way at the end of Deuteronomy, one of the very last mitzvahs that were told in the Torah, this mitzvah really encapsulates the reason as to why God created the world. Moreover, there's another midrash that tells us that the merit of entering and settling the land hinges upon fulfillment of this particular mitzvah. The mitzvah Bikurim is the one that will determine how well the Jewish people enter, conquer, and settle the land. And it's also different than all other agricultural mitzvahs in several ways. So, for example, there's um, various kinds of tithings. There's the teruma that's given to the Kohen, tithing that's given to the Levite, and those, of course, are obligatory. However, the law states that those are only obligatory if we choose to benefit from them. Suppose I have a field and I don't want to sell it, I don't want to eat it, I just want to let it rot. I don't need to separate the tithing and the truma from that particular field. Whereas by Bikurim, it's different. I have a first fruit, right away I am obligated in this particular mitzvah. Also, this mitzvah is only activated when the land is conquered and settled, unlike all other agricultural mitzvahs. It only applies to the seven special fruits that the land of Israel is praised with. Also, Rashi tells us that the owner does this very strange ceremony of tying the string around the budding first fruit. And finally, unlike all the other mitzvahs of agriculture, we have over here this declaration that really broadens the mitzvah to going all the way back to Laban and talking about the Exodus and trying to give this whole retrospective of Jewish history when you bring these first fruits to the temple. So there's probably a lot of ways to understand this mitzvah, but Rashi tells us that the objective of Bikurim is to demonstrate that we are not ingracious. We appreciate the goodness that God does for us. I have a field. The field yields fruit. I want to thank God I want to bring these fruits to Jerusalem. But in itself, if you realize when someone takes the fruits and they bring it to Jerusalem and they have this whole proclamation, that in itself is a tacit acknowledgement of God's total dominion. When you thank God for your crops, you're demonstrating, you're showing that he effectuated those crops. And this is, in fact, the challenge of life. And specifically after the settlement of the land, the Jewish people hitherto, have been living a miraculous lifestyle. Their food is the manna, they have Moses, they're drinking water from the rock, they're enveloped, they're surrounded by this ever-present cloud by day and pillar of fire at night. This is a supernatural existence. And you know what? They're going to cross the Jordan, and to a certain degree, the supernatural existence is going to continue. They're going to have miraculous wars of conquest, and Joshua is going to be an able replacement for Moses. But once things settle down, everyone gets their own plot of land, they're going to start working the field, and when someone works the field, and there's fruit, there's a yield, that's where the challenge is. That's where the tendency for someone to say, you know, this bounty, these fruits, this yield is the product of my hard work, comes along this mitzvah, specifically at the moment 
when you start to feel a little bit happy with your own success. I put in an entire season's worth of work. I plowed and I watered it properly. And finally, the first fruits they budded. Right away at that moment where the risk of you forgetting God is at its highest, you right away stop. And you tie a string around it, even though you're not going to bring the fruits till a little bit later. But right away, you nip it in the bud, almost quite literally, you take that bud of the fruit and you tie a string around it and you announce and you declare your intention. I'm going to f- not forget God. I'm going to remember that really it's him behind the scenes. And then you get to Jerusalem and you make this whole declaration. And this whole pronouncement is all along these lines. We're acknowledging that all the goodness that God did to us From the beginning, all the way back to Laban, all the way back to the Exodus, all the way back to the very beginning of our nation. And that is, of course, critically important. It's so important. This attitude is so necessary. The success or failure of the settlement depends upon the proper fulfillment of this mitzvah, but also the idea behind it, which is not forgetting God. And the Midrash goes so far as to say, this is why God created the world. So humans should have the challenge of Bikurim, the challenge to recognize God's hand in their life, to recognize God's dominion, to accept it, or, God forbid, to ignore it. It's been pointed out that in Hebrew, the word for lack of gratitude, ingratitude, not recognizing the good that others do to you, and the word for heresy, they actually share the same Hebrew word, kefira, whereas gratitude and appreciation, that's the same word as acknowledgement of truth as admittance. And that word is hoda. When we thank God, when we appreciate God, when we show our gratitude to God, we're admitting, we're acknowledging, we're attesting to his total dominion. That's the first mitzvah of our parsha, the mitzvah of first fruits and its declaration. And in verse 12, we read about a second kind of declaration, which is called the confession of the tithes. And this is when you finish a tithing cycle. Rashi tells us that that's at Passover Eve of the fourth year. As we've mentioned in the past, there is a seven-year cycle, the Shemitah cycle, the seventh year, the last year. There's no work, and therefore there's no tithes. And therefore you have six years of work, and it's broken down into two groups of three, year one, two, and three, and four, five, and six. Year one and two, there's first tithing to the Levites, 10%. Second tithing brought to Jerusalem. Year three, there's first tithe to the Levite. And the second tithe is not brought to Jerusalem eaten as a family. Rather, it is given to the poor, also a 10%. Thus, every three years, you have an entire cycle of tithing. And Passover Eve of the fourth year, when you finally reconcile all the bills of the previous tithing cycle, you have what's called the confession of the tithes, where you declare that you have completed a cycle. And the Torah goes on to delineate the various kinds of tithing. It talks about the first tithe, the second tithe, the tithe for the poor, the fruits of the fourth year. That's a fruit tree. The fourth year, the fourth year's fruits are consecrated to God. The truma, which is given to the Kohen, that there's no minimum for, but it's around 2%. And finally, the Bikurim that we just mentioned right now. Those are the six different tithes that it talks about. You announce before God, I have done all my tithing properly. I have done him according to his laws. I did it in order. First the Bikurim, then the Truma, then the first tithe, then the second tithe, and so on. I only tithe from one kind of produce for the yield of that particular produce. So I can't take wheat, for example, and use it as tithe for my yield of barley. I said my proper blessings. I did not eat the sacred food between when a relative died and was buried. I did not eat the sacred food when either I or the food was impure. I did not use it for provisions for the dead. And finally, I brought them to the temple. And after the person does this whole confession, At the eve of Passover of the fourth year, he makes a request and a passionate plea for divine blessing. Gaze down from your holy abode, from the heavens, and bless your people Israel and the ground that you gave us as you swore to our forefathers a land flowing with milk and honey. Rashi tells us that what this person is saying is that I have just shown, I've demonstrated that I've done my job, 
Now you do yours. You told us to follow the laws. We followed them to a T. And now you do your part. You give us the blessing and the bounty that you promised that you'll give to us in the event that we obey your will. Verse 16 begins with a new theme. The theme of this day, Hashem your God commands us to perform the decrees and the statutes and you should observe them and perform them with all your heart, with all your soul. What does it mean this day? We're starting now a new period in Deuteronomy. It says the Ramban, we finished all the new mitzvos that are the repetition of Torah of Deuteronomy, and now it's time to transition to the next stage. That's what the Ramban says. Rashi has a different take on this verse. What does it mean that this day God commands us to perform the decrees? What this means is that every day that we do the will of God, we should view it with the same excitement and with the same joy as if today we were commanded. And therefore, even though we're reading the verse, you know, many thousands of years after Moses uttered them, but every day it should still be true that this day God commands us to do these mitzvos. And then it goes on to talk about what does it mean? What does it mean that our nation accept upon ourselves this mandate of doing the mitzvos, and what is this relationship that we have with God? And it talks about a mutual relationship. We chose God. We chose to obey His laws, to walk in His ways, to observe His decrees, His commandments, His statutes, to hearken to His voice. And the Almighty reciprocated. He distinguished us. We're going to be for Him a treasured people, like He spoke to us. He's going to make us supreme over all the nations. We're going to have our stature, we're going to be praised, we're going to have renown, we're going to have splendor, we're going to be a holy people. The Almighty is going to reciprocate, we're going to fulfill our destiny as being God's chosen people. There's a very important Sephorno here, here. he says, he says, we embody what God wants to achieve with the human species, namely, that man can choose to become like God. And if you remember, says the Sephardo, go back to the very first verse that discusses the notion of man. God says, let us make man in our image, in God's image. Here we see that the Jewish people, when they're obeying the Torah, it's the ultimate manifestation, it's the ultimate embodiment, personification of what God wants out of humanity. Chapter 27 is dedicated to what the Jewish people need to do once they cross the Jordan. And of course, Moses is not going to be with them. Joshua is going to lead them. And there's going to be a lot of very important things that they need to take care of immediately upon entering the land. Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, observe the entire commandment that I command you today. It shall be on the day that you cross the Jordan to the land that Hashem your God gives you, you should set up great stones. You should coat them with plaster Inscribe upon them the words of the Torah when you cross over so that you may enter the land that Hashem your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Hashem, the God of your forefathers, spoke to you. So there's a very interesting instruction here. The day we cross, we take great stones, cover them with plaster, upon them we write the words of Torah. Now Rashi, quoting from the Talmud of the book of Sota, tells us that there are actually three sets of stone use that day. There's going to be the initial set of stone. When the Jewish people cross the Jordan, the Jordan splits miraculously. It's a recreation of the splitting of the sea. And Joshua is going to command 12 men, one from each tribe, to lift a stone from the riverbed. And that's going to be erected as a monument of the great miracle of the splitting of the Jordan in Gilgal, which is the place that they're going to encamp that evening. But before they get to Gilgal, they're going to go to a different place, which is the mountain of Grisim, Mount Grisim and Mount Abel. And those stones are going to be temporarily erected as an altar, as a monument near Mount Grisim and Mount Abel, upon which the Torah is going to be written. And then those stones, that altar is going to be disassembled and re-erected as a permanent monument in Gilgal. So that's two sets of stones or two roles that stones are going to play. But in addition, there's also the 12 other stones that Joshua is going to take and is going to erect as a monument in the Jordan itself to stand testimony for the great miracles that the Jewish people experienced when they crossed over 
the Jordan. In addition, we're going to read about the special ceremony the Jewish people are going to do once they get to Mount Ebal and Mount Rizim on the first day of their conquest, of their entering of the land. It shall be that when you cross the Jordan, you shall write these stones, of which I command you today, on Mount Ebal, and you should coat them with plaster. Then you should build an altar for Hashem your God, an altar of stones, don't raise an iron upon it, like the altar of the tabernacle and subsequently the temple. You cannot use metal to smooth out those stones. Of whole stones shall you build the altar, bring sacrifices there, and again, inscribe on the stones all the words of the Torah, well clarified. Once the nation is going to be assembled by these two mountains, and today actually we know where these mountains are, it's near Shechem, near what's modern day Nablus, it's the center of the country. Joshua will take those 12 stones, and he's going to assemble them as an altar on Mount Ebal, plaster them with plaster, and write upon that altar the entire Torah very clearly, which means according to some of the commentaries in 70 languages, others maybe understand it a little bit differently. It's not necessarily the whole Torah, maybe it's the Ten Commandments, maybe it's just the mitzvos, but he's going to write something on those stones that's going to fall under the category of all of Torah. There's a discussion in the Talmud, was it written on top of the plaster? Was it written under the plaster? But that day, the altar is going to be dismantled and it's going to be brought back to Gilgal, which is which is south of, of Mount Greece and Mount Abel. It's on the eastern end of Jericho. And then, in fact, that location is going to be used as the capital of the nation for the next 14 years. And Joshua is going to re-erect those 12 stones upon which the Torah is written as a permanent monument. Now, there's a very interesting Ramban here. The Ramban quotes the Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra writes that when they write the Torah on these stones, it's not going to be all of Torah, rather it's the, the list of mitzvos. And the Rabban, he quotes the Talmud, says, no, it means all of the Torah in 70 languages. And he asks the obvious question, how could you write all of Torah in 70 languages on a monument of stones? And he suggests, or he speculates, it's possible that these were very, very large stones. That's his first suggestion, or maybe it was some sort of miracle. When we actually read the book of Joshua about what the Jewish people did on that first day, it's clear that there were a lot of miracles of that day. Now, the Rabban asked this question, why do we need this very dramatic ceremony? Why is it so important? On the very first day the Jewish people cross over the Jordan, they have this very elaborate dramatic ceremony where they go to the mountains, and we still haven't read what happens on those mountains, but they, they take the stones, put the stones on the riverbed, take other stones, bring them to Mount Rizim and Mount Abel, erect another altar. Why is it so important to do this very dramatic ceremony on the day the Jewish people enter? And the Rabban tells us, this is to tell us, this is to remind us that the reason why the Jewish people are meriting to conquer the land, all that is because of the Torah and the Jewish people's adherence to it. And therefore, it's very important at the very beginning of the Jewish people's conquest and settlement of the land to drill this idea home that the reason why we're entering and our merit to maintain our sovereignty, our hegemony in this land, it's all because of the Torah. This is the sign that you erect on the land. The sign is Torah. The verse continues, Moses and the Kohanim, the Levites, spoke to all of Israel, saying, Be attentive and hear, O Israel. This day you have become a people to Hashem your God. You shall hearken to the voice of Hashem your God. You shall perform all His commandments and all His decrees, which I command you today. Today, says Moses to the Jewish people, today you became a nation. Again, the same idea that Moses is telling them today something very significant is happening. So Rashi repeats the principle that we saw a little bit earlier, that the lesson is that every day we should treat it as if that day we entered the covenant with God. Jewish people, we're God's nation. We have a covenant. But every day we should remember or we should think about that today we became a nation. We have to feel today, the day you're listening to this podcast, the day that I'm speaking, 100 years from now, 100 years ago, every single day, we have to find some way to believe, to feel as if today we became a nation. And this is, again, a theme that we see throughout Deuteronomy. In fact, 
in the Shema in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, when it says that I command you today, Rashi again says that the Torah should not be like some old commandment that loses its excitement. Rather, it should be something new, something exciting, something that has an appeal and allure. Everyone runs to hear the new news. That's what mitzvahs are supposed to be. And I think this raises a very important point. We naturally tend to have loss of novelty the more we immerse ourselves in in a subject or in a matter or, or in activity. And yet here we see again and again throughout Deuteronomy this theme that we do a mitzvah, we should make believe this is the first time we're doing it. So exciting. When we study Torah, it's novel. It's not stale. It's full of passion. It's full of zest. It's exciting. There's enlightenment. There's joy. There's vigor in the study. And similarly, the Jewish people, we're a nation, nation of God. That's not old news. That's not information of yesteryear of your. This is today. Today we became a nation. Today we became God's nation. Oh, amazing. Mind-blowing. How exciting. And the obvious question is that how do we actually do that? How do we actually gain that feeling? When we study Torah, hopefully it's exciting, but maybe does it tend to become cumbersome over time? What do you do when people stop being motivated or inspired to study to grow? And in fact, isn't there a scripture that says clearly there's nothing new under the sun? Is there a secret, perhaps, to making what could be old and stale, making that new? So there's a very fascinating teaching in the Talmud The book of Brachos, page 63b. And it's based upon this verse, 27.9 of Deuteronomy. Hearken, listen, O Israel. Today you became a nation. Again, the Talmud asks our question. Today you became a nation? This is 40 years after the Exodus. We're at the very end of Moses' life, the very end of the 40-year sojourn in the wilderness. It's been 40 years the Jewish people are a nation. What does it mean that the Torah is telling us, that Moses is telling us, today we became a nation, says the Talmud. Again, this is quoted by Rashi. To teach you that Torah is beloved on those who study it every day, as if that day it was given to them from Mount Sinai. If we were at Sinai and we got the Torah, how excited would we be to actually immerse ourselves in its study? It's old. We've had it for 3,000 years. That's why we lose excitement. But if you really study Torah, says the Talmud, Every day, if you have consistency, then every day it will feel like it is new. And the Talmud continues by bringing a proof, and it tells us that if someone reads the Shema every day, morning and night, and one night they don't read the Shema, it's as if they never read the Shema in their lives. So this is a a big subject and a very deep idea. But what we're told here in the Talmud and in other sources, we're being told here is that there's a very stark difference between spiritual activities and non-spiritual, material, physical activities. With physical activities, the peak of excitement is the first time you do something. The first time you skydive or take a bungee jump or do any sort of exhilarating physical exercise or activity... That's the time where it's most novel, it's most new, it's most exciting. You've done it a hundred times, it becomes a little bit rote, it becomes a habit, it becomes a thing that you do. It doesn't have that same thrill. That is by material and physical pursuits. However, what the Talmud is telling us, that with spiritual pursuits, with Torah, with mitzvahs, it's the exact opposite. It's an acquired taste. The first time you study, that's the hardest time. Day one is the peak of difficulty, and the more you immerse yourself into it, the more pleasant it becomes. And therefore, when someone studies Torah every day, you would think someone like that would get sick of it. No, it's the opposite. Every day if someone studies Torah, it's as if that day they got it from Sinai. Whereas someone does the Shema every day, and then they take a day off, it's as if they never said it before, because every time they said it, it wasn't really a spiritual exercise It was an action of rote. There's a very deep insight here. The insight is that novelty exists 
and we don't want to lose it. But the way to maintain it, the way to perpetuate novelty is exactly opposite in the spiritual and the physical worlds. In the spiritual world, the way to maintain novelty is to avoid ever taking a break. If you say the Shema every single day, every day the Shema has meaning. If you study Torah every day, every day the Torah is as, as, as exciting as it was at Sinai. Whereas in the physical world, the way to actually maintain novelty is via abstinence. In fact, the Talmud tells us that when a woman menstruates, so she is prohibited to be with her husband intimately for a duration of several weeks. Says the Talmud, why did the Almighty make this commandment that when a woman is going through her period, she has to separate from her husband? The reason, says the Talmud, is because otherwise, if they never have a break, there's going to be a loss of novelty, and therefore, they're going to grow sick of each other. And therefore, the Torah says, separate for several days, separate for several weeks. That way, you'll restore the excitement and the love and the joy and anticipation of the two members of the couple for each other, like the day that they got married. The spark and the joy and the excitement, the novelty of the relationship that it was on day one of their marriage can be restored via abstinence, whereas in the spiritual world, it's the exact opposite. Consistency and indulgence in the physical world leads to boredom and subsequently revulsion. Consistency in the spiritual world has the exact opposite effect. It leads to pleasure and it leads to newness and novelty. Yes, King Solomon tells us, the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. But our sages tell us that the spiritual world, it's not a world under the sun, it's a world over the sun. And over the sun... In the spiritual realms, in heaven, indeed there, novelty resides. Okay, so that's an idea that we see here on the sages about maintaining that excitement and that novelty with our spiritual world. And then it begins talking about the blessings and the curses that the Jewish people are going to do once they arrive at Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. The nation is going to be divided into three groups. There's going to be the elders of the tribe of Levi and the Kohanim. They're going to stand between the two mountains together with the ark. There's going to be six tribes, Shimon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. They're going to be encamped on or near Mount Gerizim, which is a green and luscious mountain. That's going to be the mountain of blessing. There's going to be six other tribes, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zevulon, Dan, and Naphtali. They're going to be on the other mountain, Mount Ebal. It's a rocky, it's a barren mountain. And upon which that mountain, Josh was going to erect the altar with the Torah written in 70 languages. And they're going to begin with the pronouncements of 11 plus 1. So 12 blessings and curses. You're going to have the Levites in the middle. They're going to turn towards Mount Gerizim, the mountain of blessing. And they're going to start with a blessing. Blessed is is he who does not make an idol. And everyone's going to announce, Amen, Amen. And they're going to turn towards the other mountain and give the identical words, but just in the opposite. And they're going to curse someone who does make an idol. So they're going to bless someone who does not make an idol. And they're going to curse someone who does make an idol. And again, everyone is going to announce, Amen. Everyone's going to sign on. And this is the process of beginning of kickstarting this settlement of the land, the Jewish people are going to sign off on this commitment as embodied by these 11 plus 1, 11 uh, blessings and curses and pronouncements, and everyone's going to accept it upon them. So it begins, the first one is about idolatry, curses someone who does idolatry, curses someone who belittles their parents, curses someone who steals land by moving the landmarks. And after each one of these curses and parallel blessings, both sides are going to say amen. Number four, misdirecting, misleading the blind, 
or someone who knows very little about a subject. Number five, curse is someone who corrupts the judgment of the widow and the orphan. Curse is someone who sleeps with his father's wife. Curse is someone who engages in bestiality. Curse is someone who sleeps with their sister or sleeping with their mother-in-law. Smiting one's friend hiddenly. So Rashi tells us that refers to Lashon Hara. And finally, cursed is someone who takes bribes to facilitate someone dying. And finally, after those 11 specific blessings and curses, you have the inclusive blessing and cursed, and that is a cursed is one who will not uphold the words of Torah to perform them. The entire nation says amen, and of course the flip side of that is is blessed is someone who does uphold the words of Torah to perform them. Thus, on the very first day of their settlement of the land, the entire people committed themselves to upholding the entire Torah. That's how Rashi understands what this final verse is. That, yes, you have the specific blessings and curses, but then you have that catch-all, this inclusive blessing and curse, blessed is someone who upholds the Torah, who obeys the Torah, and cursed is someone who does not uphold the Torah. It appears from Rashi that if someone does not obey any matter of Torah, they are already included in this malediction. I think there's a very important Ramban here. The Ramban, he makes a distinction between heresy and incomplete observance. He points out, it doesn't say, cursed is someone who doesn't do, doesn't obey the words of Torah. It says, cursed is someone who doesn't uphold the words of Torah. What does it mean to uphold the Torah, says the Ramban? What it means is that in your heart, you acknowledge that the mitzvos are true. In your eyes, you view them as real. And you believe that if someone does the mitzvos, they have reward, they have goodness. And if someone sins, God forbid, they'll be punished. Those are the critical beliefs, the foundations of our faith. If you don't believe that, then you are included in this malediction, in this curse to someone who does not uphold the Torah. But what if you have someone who believes it all, but you know what? It's very difficult to actually adhere to it all, not make any mistakes. Someone maybe made a mistake, they did a sin. And he gives a few examples. They didn't sit in the sukkah, they didn't shake the lulav, they ate some non-kosher. Says the Rabban, someone like that is not included in this malediction, Again, the verse does not say someone who does not do all the words of Torah, rather someone who does not uphold it. And that means someone who believes in the central tenets of the religion to the exclusion of the heretics and the rebels. And therefore, we could hopefully say from this that we're all included in those who are blessed. We're blessed are the ones who do uphold the words of Torah and we do perform them. We still believe, yes, all of us make mistakes, but we all believe in in the veracity of Torah, and therefore we uphold the words of the Torah and we perform them. Now Rashi points out that there's only 11 specific curses, and he tells us that that corresponds to 11 tribes. 11 tribes, you ask? Aren't there 12 tribes? So Rashi tells us a very interesting idea. At the end of Moses' life, in a couple of weeks we're going to read about it, Moses is going to give blessings to 11 of the 12 tribes. There's going to be one tribe, the tribe of Shimon, that is not going to be blessed by Moses before he dies. And therefore, Moshe is going to give curses here, 11 curses corresponding to 11 tribes. But because he's not going to bless the tribe of Shimon, he's also going to withhold his rebuke from them. The rebuke that they're going to get by not getting a blessing is enough. There's no need to add a curse for them, a malediction for them. It's only 11 specific curses. Chapter 28 is one of the scariest chapters in all of Torah. It's one of the two places that the Torah describes the admonition, what happens to us when we disobey the Torah, when we deviate away from God. And I think after the vicissitudes and the suffering and the tremendous pain that our nation has experienced over our 4,000 years, and especially in modern times, we know terrible things have happened to us. When we read these words, it will probably send an extra chill down our spine today indeed, post facto, 
we could see how these curses were tragically fulfilled when they fell upon our nation, when we didn't obey the Torah and we suffered as the Torah predicted with accuracy would happen. But it starts off very positively. What happens if we do obey the Torah? It shall be that if you hearken to the voice of Hashem your God to observe, to perform all His commandments that I command you this day, then Hashem your God will make you supreme over all the nations. All the blessings will come upon you, will overtake you if you hearken to the voice of Hashem your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. You blessed your womb, i.e. your children will be blessed, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of the fruit of your animals, the offspring of your cattle, the flocks of your sheep and goats. All of our property is going to be blessed. Blessed shall be your fruit basket and your kneading bowl. You bless when you come in and bless when you go out. Rashi tells us that that means we'll be blessed when we're born and blessed when we die. We'll live a sinless life. Hashem will cause our enemies to rise up, who rise up against us to be struck down. They attack us with one road and they're going to flee and scatter in seven. God will command the blessing upon our storehouses. Everything that we touch will turn to gold. We'll be confirmed as a holy people, all provided that we observe the commandments of Hashem our God and go in His ways. All people of the earth will see that the name of God is proclaimed over us, will be special and distinct, not only in God's eyes, but in the eyes of the nations. Hashem will give you bountiful goodness and the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your animals and the fruit of your ground. On the ground that Hashem swore to your forefathers to give you, He will open up His storehouses of goodness, the heavens provide rain in its time, bless us in all kinds of ways. We're going to lend to others. We're going to have so much capital to lend, but we're not going to need to borrow. Hashem will make us a head and not a tail. The Rabban is bothered by the fact that it seems like it's extra if we're a head. Of course, we're not a tail. If God promises that we'll become a head. Why is it necessary to tell us that we won't become tails? And he gives two explanations. Number one, even if someone is a head, they could still be a tail because there could be someone who's ahead of their head. And therefore, what it means is that we'll be totally supreme over all, we'll be the head to all and the tail to none. In addition, Rabban suggests the second answer is that we'll be heads from now on and not tails forever. In all times, again, this is in the event that we fulfill the Torah, in all times, we will reign supreme. But then, what happens if we do not hearken to the voice of Hashem our God, we don't observe His commandments, we ignore His decrees, we cease walking in His ways. The Torah is going to go on for many, many, many verses about all the curses that will fall upon us and overtake us. And in fact, when they read this in Shul, in the synagogue, on Shabbos, it's said quietly, it's said quickly, because it's very sad, it's very depressing. Even though it is informative and it is educational, And it is valuable to realize that there's cause and effect in history and the fact that the Almighty created us with free will and we have choices and we can remain righteous. We can observe the Torah despite the tremendous challenges and temptations that are posed by the world around us. And every once in a while, in the event that we stray, then God corrects our path. He nudges us back to where we're supposed to be. And our sages tell us in the book of Megillah, page 31b, that every year this Parsha Parsha's Kisavo is read right before Rosh Hashanah. Why? So that we end the year and all its curses. These are the curses that befall the Jewish people. We want to make sure let's get rid of it before the year ends and let's start the year fresh. And of course, our hope and our prayer is that indeed our year will start fresh and it'll be a year replete and bursting with blessing. So it begins by talking generically that if we disobey the Torah, we're going to be cursed in all kinds of ways, cursed in the city, cursed in the field, cursed our fruit basket, cursed our kneading bowl, our children, God forbid, will be cursed, our animals, our our flock, our cattle, The Ramban points out that the order is changed in the blessing. Our children are blessed first and only subsequently the produce and the basket and the bowl. But here it's the other way around. First, we're cursed, God forbid, by our produce and our our basket and our bowl and only subsequently the children. And the Ramban tells us that the reason why it's flipped around is because the objective 
of the curse is not to punish, it's to awaken us. Hopefully, when our flocks suffer, when our fruits suffer, when our produce suffer, we take the message. We absorb what God's trying to tell us, and we repent, we rectify, we refine our behavior, and our children will be spared. But here we read, again, it's very difficult to read. It's very painful to read. We'll, we'll go through it really quickly. But it, it gets worse and worse. It starts with it starts off with pestilence. It goes on to various illnesses. We'll have bloated flesh and fever and inflammation. We'll suffer from the sword of our enemies. We'll have crop destroying floods. There'll be mildew and mold in our storage houses. The heavens will be bronze. The earth will be iron. Rashi points out that Moses actually lessened the curse. It would have been a lot worse if the heavens were iron and the earth was bronze because bronze sweats a little bit. We want the heavens to sweat, not the earth, because otherwise it will ruin the food, the produce that is in our storage houses. There's going to be dust that's going to destroy the crops. We're going to be an emblem of suffering in the eyes of the nation. Our corpses will be eaten by the birds. The boils of Egypt will befall us. The boils of Egypt, Rashi tells us, are are the worst kinds of boils. They're moist on the outside and dry on the inside. We're going to be stricken with madness, with blindness, with dismay. We're going to grope in the dark like a blind person. Our efforts won't bear fruit. We'll betroth and someone else will marry. We'll build houses and someone else will dwell. Our animals will be taken from us. Our children, God forbid, will be kidnapped. We're going to yearn fruitlessly for their return. We're going to be driven mad. We're going to be exiled. In the exile, we're not going to depart from the idolatry. The Ramban details how all these curses were actually fulfilled in the Roman exile, the destruction of the Second Temple, and how it's hinting to Agrippas and Aristobulus and Titus and Vespasian, all the events of the destruction of the Second Temple are actually hinted over here in these very difficult passages. Locusts and worms will consume our produce. The foreigners will send over us. The curses will consume us. And all this is because we did not serve God with joy amidst plenty. All these terrible things that happened to us, it's all because you did not serve Hashem, your God, amid gladness and goodness of heart when everything was abundant. It's an amazing thing here. There's a fantastic statement here. Why do all these bad things befall us? Because we didn't serve God with joy. Now, it's interesting. There is no verse, to my knowledge, that tells us that we must serve God with joy. Yet, because we did not serve God with joy, all these terrible things happened to us. And I think the lesson is is really simple. How can we not be joyous? The Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, gave us the keys to maximizing life. It's the most exciting, exhilarating, intoxicating thing imaginable. Our life matters. God loves us. He shows us how to attain true joy and pleasure out of the world. Torah and mitzvot are the things that should cause us to erupt with exuberance. If we don't show the joy in our doing of the mitzvot, we view it as a burden. We're seeking ways to dispense with them. We're really not connecting to God on any level. And that really is the key for our undoing. Why does someone abandon Torah? Why does someone abandon mitzvahs? Why does someone follow the idols? Of course, the idols of yore and there's the idols of today. Why do people do that? Because they don't recognize what an amazing gift the Almighty gave us when he gave us the Torah and the mitzvahs. If you do recognize that, you, of course, do the mitzvahs with tremendous joy. And the curses continue. There's going to be foreign nations that are going to attack us. We're going to resort to cannibalism of the worst kind. I don't even want to read it. All this is, again, if we don't guard the laws, the maladies of Egypt will cleave to us, will be few in number. The joy that God had to do good for us is going to be converted to the joy of our enemies for our punishment. We're going to be racked with uncertainty. Will I die today? Will I die tomorrow? It's going to get worse and worse. In the morning, you say, oh, maybe tonight will bring relief, but tonight it gets worse. You'll say, well, maybe tomorrow will get get relief. Things are going to be so bad that we won't even be bought as slaves. No one's going to want to buy us, and our punishment is going to be death and destruction. So again, this is very, very difficult to read it. We will try to run through it really quickly. But again, it's 50-some-odd verses 
of all these terrible things that are going to happen to us, and we know historically did happen to us over the course of our history. Again, this is a covenant that God is commanding with us. He sealed it with our forebearers, with our fathers. In addition to the covenant that was sealed with us at Sinai, this, again, very binary agreement. If we obey Torah, if we cleave to God, if we go in His ways, fantastic things will happen to us. But unfortunately, if we choose the other path, if we choose the path of abandoning God, abandoning His Torah, all these terrible, horrific, brutal, even painful to read curses will and did befall us. Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, You have seen everything that Hashem did before your eyes, the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants, to all his land. So this is going to begin the next stage of Deuteronomy. We're done with all the mitzvahs. There's going to be a few mitzvahs that we're still going to read uh, in the next couple of weeks. But now Moses is giving that final parting message to the nation. And he summons all of Israel. The Archaim says that when Moses gave them all these curses, it was only the men there. But now when it's going to be about what we actually need to do, that final message that Moses wants to convey to the nation, even the women and the children are there. And therefore Moses summoned all of Israel. And he begins by talking about all the things that we have to be thankful to the Almighty for. All the miracles he did to Pharaoh, all the miracles that happened in the Exodus, the great trials that your eyes beheld, the great signs, the great wonders. And then Moses sprinkles in a little bit of critique. But Hashem did not give you a heart to know, or eyes to see, or ears to hear until this day. Again, that familiar motif of this day. What does it mean that we don't have the heart to know, the eyes to see, the ears to hear, to understand God until this day? So what exactly is Dominic Rashi tells us? Two different interpretations. Either that a person does not have the capacity to fully understand their teacher until they have ruminated over their words for 40 years. The Jewish people, they've been under Moses' tutelage for 40 years, and therefore they weren't expected, they didn't have the eyes, the ears, and the heart to really understand, to really absorb the message for 40 years. But now it's 40 years, and now on this day, it's time for them to open up their eyes. As an aside, my grandfather of blessed memory, he considered himself, and he was, the student of Rabbi Rucham Levavitz, who was the head of the Mir Yeshiva in Poland. And Rabbi Rucham actually passed away in 1936, quite young actually, he was 61 years old when he passed away. And then, 40 years later, in 1976, I actually have copies of my grandfather's notes, my grandfather gave a series of discourses that encapsulated the teachings of his teacher. And in fact, those discourses were eventually published in a book, which is like a biography, but like a spiritual biography of his teacher. And he begins the book by saying, our sages tell us that a person does not fully understand the Torah, the wisdom, the insights of his teacher, until they've ruminated over it for 40 years. And what he's implying is that since his teacher passed, he's been constantly toiling and ruminating over his Torah, and now it's been 40 years, and now he wants to share his findings with everyone. And indeed, we have this amazing book that he wrote that really encapsulates the central messages of the great Rabbi Ruch Malavav, it's the teacher of my grandfather. That's one idea that Rashi tells us with respect to this verse, that we don't have the eyes or the ears or the heart to understand until this day. Alternatively, Rashi tells us that on this day, they accepted the Torah eagerly. Why? Rashi tells us that on that day, Moses wrote his first copy of a Torah scroll, and he gave it to the tribe of Levi. And the rest of the Jewish people came to Moses. They said to Moses, our teacher, we also stood by Sinai. We also received the Torah. How come you're giving the copy of the written Torah only to the people of your tribe, to the Levites. Tomorrow they may come and say that, no, the Torah was given to us, not to you. When Moses heard that, 
He was so happy. He was so joyous. And he said to them, Today you became a nation. Today I understood that you are cleaving and desirous of God. This is the same thing that Moses gives them the curses. And this is this day, this, this tremendous day where the status of the nation is changing. Now they're understanding. Now they're absorbing. Now they have fully digested the messages. Now they're ready to hear the curses, to be prepared mentally and spiritually for what lies ahead. The Parsha ends with words of comfort. Moses reminds them, of course, everything that happened over the past 40 years, all the miracles that happened to them, their garments didn't wear out, their shoes did not wear out, they didn't eat bread or wine, they ate the manna, and you arrived to the this place, to the east bank of the Jordan, you had these two fearsome kings, Sichon, king of Cheshbon, Og, king of Bashan, they did battle with us, we destroyed them, we have their land now, it's an inheritance for the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half of the tribe of Menashe, and the parasha ends, you shall observe the words of this covenant, and you shall perform them, so that you will succeed in all that you do. Next week is going to begin with more words of comfort and Moses' message to the nation. I thank you all for listening. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to speaking to you next week.